Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar from Sontech here in San Diego. It's choose the right ADV and use it like a pro today. I'm Janice Lansfeld, the product manager here at Sontech. And I'm Shua Fan, application engineer at Sontech. So real quickly, this is what we'll be going over today. I'd just like to make a few comments on, on why we're doing this webinar, why I think it'd be interesting to you, uh, overview the different kinds of ADVs that we'll be discussing. But I don't want to just talk about ADVs. I think the more interesting way to talk about ADVs is to show how people are actually using them in some recent research. And that's the way to understand how the ADVs can be used in different ways and different configurations that are out there. And of course, we'll leave time for questions and answers. Uh, so please feel free to type in your questions as we go. We'll try to get to them at least by the end. And if not, don't worry. What we usually do is type out all the answers and send that into a document to everybody after the webinar. So um, why this webinar? Why today? Um, I think a lot of people, uh, certainly on the line too, already know what the ADV is and know what it can be used for. And I think a lot of the, our understanding is geared more toward traditional hydraulic research. So that's what ADVs are used for. But as research trends evolve and people are doing new and cooler things um, with research, they're doing new and cooler things with ADVs that I think is worth sharing. And um, also acoustics still have a place alongside uh, some of the newer technologies like lasers and, and optical instruments. Uh, which are good, but um, we'll talk about how acoustics are used um, uh, and the, the advantages there. Um, just real quickly at the end, we're going to hit on some of the new developments in our newest ADV, the, the handheld ADV, the Flow Tracker 2, and why I think um, it's going to have more research uses going ahead. And then lastly, wanted to note that, you know, here at Sontech, we see what people are interested in by the questions they ask about the research they're doing. And a lot of the focus tends to be on ADCPs. And it's true, ADCPs are getting smaller, they sample faster, they're more capable, but um, I think people sometimes forget that you know, trying to squeeze an ADV in the wrong place is maybe not the right tool. There's still ADVs out there that are probably the best tool in some of these situations. So again, don't want to bore those of us who know what an ADV is, but just to get everybody on the same page before we proceed, um, ADVs are acoustic, Doppler, they measure the Doppler shift uh, to in, uh, measure the water velocity, so velocimeter. But as you'll see later in the webinar, ADVs have uses uh, far beyond velocity. You can do a lot more with that acoustic signal, and then you can do a lot more to derive other parameters related to velocity and, say, backscatter. Uh, and historically, ADVs have been preferred methods because once they come from the factory, the user doesn't have to calibrate them. They are a very precise measurement, uh, temporally and spatially, of what you're trying to measure. The sampling volume is remote, so those signature prongs of the ADV do not touch the water that they're actually measuring. And as you'll see in, in uh, a case in, in a little bit here, ADVs can handle some amount of fouling better than other sensors, such as, say, optical sensors, where not only the measurement itself, but then the calibration could be in question. And then after you acquire a data set, you know, maybe not a whole lot you can do with it. Not true of ADVs, necessarily. So as I hit upon earlier, certainly you can do classical hydraulic things with the ADVs using velocity, um, turbulence parameters, um, backscatter. But uh, as, as uh, climate change, uh, sea level rise, um, the biological impact associated with those and the effects to um, human ecosystems are more of interest in research. Um, the ADVs have more uses, uses there as well, and so that's what we're going to talk about. Real quickly, uh, again, the case study is a more interesting way to talk about it uh, for me and everybody else, but you'll see these models represented here today. Uh, the top is the ADV field, which is kind of our, our basic lab model. It comes, in a, um, comes with a splash-proof electronics box, that yellow box you see up there, that can also have a battery included in it as well. Uh, but if you want autonomous deployment, uh, a battery, recorder, and, and some of the features that go with autonomous deployment, we call that our hydro model. So that's the second picture down um, that we show with a battery electronics canister 
And then the third model down is our Argonaut ADV, which is kind of our sleek, nimble, uh, low power um, requirement, low data storage requirement ADV that's just really capable of being taken out to the field and, and deployed in, in um, tough situations. And the flow tracker too, as I said, is our handheld ADV. And then I just real briefly touch on the different acoustic frequency options for the ADV field or the Hydra. Um, we have the low frequency, 5 megahertz, up to the, six, the high frequency, 16 uh, megahertz. We also call that the micro ADV, the smallest sampling volume. We'll let Shua talk about that in a second. Uh, and then the Argonaut ADV and the flow tracker are just the 10 megahertz um, frequency. Different probe mounting options, whether you want it on a rigid stem, we even have different lengths of stems, or a cable. And I, I, we realize it's not your job to understand all the configurations, but just understand that you can mix and match um, these different configurations based on your research needs. Here's another diagram that just shows how the ADV sampling volume um, is positioned and where you would use it in your, in your work. Uh, depending on the frequency you choose, the sampling volume is a different distance from the instrument. It's a different size. And as we show in the text there, it's capable of detecting the boundary, most commonly the bottom, but any boundary that it encounters. Um, it will sample and record that distance to boundary, which you can imagine can be useful for um, understanding what's going on in the bed. And lastly, um, also understand when you're mixing and matching uh, your ADV configurations based on what you need, there are different probe geometries available. I would say the one on the right, what we call the 3D down looking, is the most popular for, for research. Um, and no, also we call it an ADV uh, 3D down looking, but you can also point it up looking and it's, it's, it, it will work that way too. Um, however, there are um, the, the 2D and the 2D, 3D configurations which have certain advantages. Uh, for example, they can work in very shallow conditions because all that needs to be submerged is those receiver and um, those receiver arms. Uh, so you can put those in really shallow requirements. Yeah, requirements. So with that, now you can mix and match and then we'll show you what uh, some of the pros, as mentioned, uh, did with their ADVs. Cool. Well, thanks, Janice, for that introduction. Uh, so as Janice mentioned, instead of going through these rather boring lists of features, um, we thought that we would take a different approach and show you different case studies and really, um, really showcase the different features and how they're actually used in, um, in research today. So the first application that we want to share with you today um, has to do with fine scale flow measurements in your log jams and how that has to do with fish behavior. So the PI on this research project was Professor Desiree Tuvos of Oregon State University. And the question that they were really trying to answer here was, are fish affected by the flow patterns around log jams? So on the top right, you can see a photo of the setup, and I'll go into more detail in a bit. Um, you can see that the environment here is super shallow, and there are quite a lot of obstacles in the water. And then on the bottom, just an example of these coho salmon juveniles that they were studying. Um, so pictured here is one of um, the sites that was studied. And so kind of the history of the area, um, this area of Oregon, it was heavily logged. And what ends up happening over time when this happens is that we see a lot of bank erosion because the trees and the root systems are no longer there. And from this erosion also comes um, an increase in velocity in the actual stream itself because these obstacles are taken away. And when you have increased velocity, you even have more erosion as time goes on. So oftentimes these artificial log jams, so right in the middle of the photo, you can see one example. Um, these artificial log jams are placed inside streams in order to mitigate this erosion process. So the question here is, well, there are a lot of um, juvenile fish and different creatures in the water using the stream moving up and down. Are these log jams affecting these, uh, these baby fish? So what really needs to happen now is that they need to establish a very high resolution velocity grid um, measurements all around these nooks and crannies inside these log jams to determine whether they, um, these log jams are actually affecting the fish 
So on the right, another photo of their setup, we have their army of four 16 megahertz micro ADVs. So as Janice mentioned, these are the smallest um, head that we, we manufacture, and this is also the highest frequency ADV that we manufacture. So their mounting system, as you can see, is quite elaborate, and they've done it such that they can very precisely figure out where they're placing the ADVs as they step through their study region. And in the back of the photo, you can um, notice these yellow canisters. Those are actually the battery canisters that are required to power these instruments in the field. So on the left is sort of an aerial diagram of their study site. So in the gray, um, gray shapes, you see the actual log jams. And then all those black dots are individual micro ADV stations, so measurements that they've taken. Um, each station they've measured at 50 hertz for five minutes. And so I hope that you'll realize throughout this case study why they actually use the micro ADV as opposed to the different models. Um, so again, the micro ADV has the smallest head, and so it can be placed in very hard to reach regions. And it has the fastest sampling frequency at 50 hertz. It also has the smallest sampling volume, so it gives you the smallest um, measurement in, again, those, those very small regions that we're trying to measure. Right, I believe the height of the sampling volume is only four and a half millimeters. Yes, exactly. So literally that small. And so in this study, they were looking at mean current, so an average over time, as well as these high resolution turbulence and strain variables. And so what's used in this study in particular, those yellow canisters, um, is what we call the underwater configuration. Uh, what's required here is that you hook it up to a computer and then you get real-time data, but you have this yellow canister for power. And you remember this very high um, output of data that they, they were able to achieve, all the black dots on the grid, was really only possible using this real-time setup because they didn't have to worry about recorder space. Um, on the top right, I'm showing another configuration, the splash-proof configuration, which requires an external power source. So you don't have this battery canister. But again, this is a real-time configuration. Um, underneath that photo is, as Janice mentioned, the autonomous or hydro configuration. And this is where we have a recorder inside the unit and you can deploy autonomously and not use a computer to gather your data. And just to be clear, the pictures shown are, are not the, six, the 16 megahertz frequencies, but you can put a 16 megahertz probe on either one of these, or a 10 megahertz probe. Mm -hmm. But just an example yeah. of different configurations exactly. right, that you have. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about how they've manipulated and processed their ADV data. Um, so, as Janice mentioned, the ADV gives you a three-dimensional, so X, Y, and Z velocity data. And in this study in particular, they use a, approximately a 10 centimeter three-dimensional grid. So they basically space their measurements out in um, 10 centimeters apart in the horizontal, as well as the vertical. And they did this because they wanted to capture the variability on the scales of these little baby fish. And so this is really possible only with this small um, micro ADV head. So again, they sampled at 50 hertz for five minutes at each station, and this resulted in 1,500 plus measurement stations and nearly 17 million velocity observations. And again, this is only really possible due to this direct connection to their laptop so they can get data in real time. All right, so the raw ADV velocities were filtered using a tool called Win ADV, and this is something that actually Sontex does not provide. It's an outside um, software made by the, the United States Bureau of Reclamation, USBR, and so you're welcome to visit this website and use the software freely. Um, so using the software, they were able to remove the data with less than 70% average correlation. So the correlation is sort of a quality parameter that we provide with all of the ADV measurements. It gives you an idea of how good your data actually are. They were also able to remove um, data with low average SNR values. The SNR is a signal-to-noise ratio. So in a measurement, you want your signal to be high enough to overcome the noise. Usually high signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR, is, um, is an indication of good data. And finally, they were able to 
de-spike their data using various techniques to just remove the outliers. And then after all this processing, this is what they end up with. So this is again this aerial view of their study region. And what's shown in these little arrows, the vectors, are the mean velocities over each sampling period. And so you can see that the main or the largest velocities occur sort of streamlined going through the log jams from left to right. And then we have this kind of slow eddy circular motion on the top right corner. So it's kind of the, the mean velocity field. So what's really interesting about this study is along with the ADV measurements, they needed to figure out how the fish are moving and where they're going. And normally what people do is they use um, divers or, or snorkelers to hover over the fish. And you can imagine with a huge object like a human hovering over these fish, you really uh, disturb their environment and they don't behave like they naturally would. So in this study in particular, they actually mounted these high resolution fish cameras. And I don't have time to go into detail, but they developed this rather complex algorithm uh, to use these, um, use the photos from the fish cameras to track the fish individually as they're moving and actually to track their tail beat rate, so how fast they're actually trying to swim in, in these regions here. We're going to say something about those colored dots that are there in the photo. Yeah, yeah. So you'll notice that the colored dots are different colors for each fish, and one lands on the nose of the fish, and one is on the tail. And so that's part of their algorithm that they, they developed in order to pick out each individual fish and then follow them throughout the, the log jam. OK, so the first display of their, their data here. Um, again, this aerial view and the colors with the squares represent the, the magnitude of the velocity. So this is from the ADV measurement. And then superimposed on this are the little dots. Uh, those are the fish that um, were found by the fish cameras. So the hypothesis in general was um, that the fish would like to stay in areas where they can expend the least energy. And so they were thinking maybe the fish would like to hang out in these low velocity regions as opposed to the high velocity regions. So it turns out that the fish, while their hypothesis is mostly true, the fish were found in these low velocity regions, but they weren't exclusively found there, which means that the fish were kind of found throughout um, in low, medium, and higher flow regions. With the ADV measurement, they were also able to look at a couple other parameters. So before we looked at sort of the time mean velocity. And if you remove that mean, you can look at um, parameters that involve the fluctuation. And so the first one is the turbulent kinetic energy, the TKE. And it really represents this um, energy extracted from these turbulent eddies in the flow. And again, they were able to do this by sampling at 50 hertz here. So what they found um, was that the fish tended to not really stay in low TKE regions, which they hypothesized would you know, help, the, help the fish expend less energy. Um, they were kind of found throughout. They were also able to look at this horizontal strain measurement, which is a representation of these horizontal gradients in the flow field. And again, they got the same result, that the fish didn't tend to favor higher or lower strain. So the main moral of this story is that the fish actually turned out to be not controlled by the velocity around these log jams. And really what they tended to prefer was um, an area of greater depth. So they actually have more room to just hang out and accumulate. And they also really liked staying near the near the actual wood of the log jam. So they actually have um, more of a hiding spot. And so although this velocity field didn't control the fish behavior, this is something that um, if you don't take measurements in this area, you would never really be able to come to that conclusion. Good. All right, so we we're talking about fish in freshwater streams. And now we're going to go to the opposite side of the environmental spectrum and talk about flow around coral reefs. And um, 
and see how the water flow will affect seeding around the coral reef. So the PI on this, uh, these research projects is Professor Chris Finelli of the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. So what they were trying to address um, was how does the water flow affect the seeding success of tube blennies, which are these cute little fish that are pictured right underneath there, and also the feeding success of giant sponges. So you'll see on the right, um, they're set up with a micro ADV. Mm. Uh, so again, we were talking about 16 megahertz micro ADVs in the previous case, and this is actually the same instrument, but just in a different environment. So you'll see on the right here that um, the configuration is slightly different. You see this long cable, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a bit. But first, just to give an overview of of the scientific question. Um, so in these coral reef systems, they, so this site location was actually off of Belize, and they were able to identify two different fish species, one that lives sort of higher up in the water column and one that lives lower. And the one that lives higher up in the water column has higher feeding rates, higher growth, and higher reproduction. And the one that lives lower has of lower rates of, of these variables. And so around these coral reefs, as you can imagine, the flow pattern is very complex. So we've got these waves and oscillations from currents and forcing. Um, we've got turbulent flows. We've got boundary layer effects. And so to determine whether these flow patterns are actually affecting the fish and why, you know, why we have this differential um, higher feeding rates versus lower feeding rates for these fish, uh, they really had to measure very precisely in, again, rather small spaces around these coral reef systems. All right. So this is a, a kind of zoomed in photo of their setup. And again, you see the micro ADV head. Um, again, they use the 16 megahertz micro ADV. And I'm sure you'll see why in, in just a second. The probe was actually placed 3.8 centimeters directly above this fish shelter. So you can see in the photo, Directly underneath the ADV head, you see this black spot. And that's actually a hole that the fish live in. So they really like to just hang out in the hole, and then they'll watch food as it passes by, and they'll snap it up when they see something good. So uh, Professor Finelli has been using our ADVs for, for quite some time now, and he's very familiar with them. And he's actually developed this um, interesting technique to determine very precisely where the sampling volume is. Um, so it turns out that from ADV to ADV, uh, the sampling volume can move around a little bit and slightly differs from instrument to instrument. And so you can imagine here where he has such precise work involved, um, he needs to know exactly where the sampling volume is. So um, I encourage you to look at the reference slide at the very end um, if you're interested in this sort of technique. So some considerations, just um, practical considerations when you're deploying in the field. Um, no frame part was directly upstream or downstream of the sampling volume, just to mitigate this, um, this flow disturbance that you might find. Um, each measurement here lasted about 120 seconds at a 10 hertz sampling rate. So you'll note that the previous, um, previous study was measured at 50 hertz. This one is um, using 10 hertz. Uh, so Obviously, this parameter is configurable. You can choose what sampling frequency you like. Um, one of the neat features about these instruments is that you can use something called burst sampling. So what that means is that within one sampling interval, you can choose up to three different um, sampling rates, what we call bursts. And what that does is it really optimizes the power consumption when you're taking a measurement. You can take a super high frequency measurement for turbulence, a medium frequency measurement um, for and you'll notice um, right on top of the photo with this yellow arrow you you'll actually see the edge of the zinc anode. And that's um, a sacrificial piece of metal 
that basically will, if it's touching the metal of the ADB head, it will corrode before the actual ADB corrodes. So that's something that um, needs to be monitored when you're deploying in the ocean and needs to be replaced when, um, when it has corroded heavily. Right, I remember uh, talking with uh, Dr. Finelli and just when you are operating in really warm, salty, tropical waters, even though these are relatively short deployments, um, hearing that the zincs need to be replaced fairly, right. fairly often. So yep. do pay attention even if your deployments are short. Absolutely. Um, and then finally, so a lot of care was taken actually to rotate the velocity vectors to be oriented along the main slope. So if you remember the previous photo with the giant sponge, you remember this long cable going from the body of the AAB to the head. Um, what that allows is more flexibility in how you set it up. But there is, so we have an option to add a compass to the ADB body. It really doesn't make sense in this setup to add the compass because it can only fit in the large body, but not the probe head. If it's so far away, the compass um, is very hard to orient with respect to the probe head. So in this case, they opted not to use a compass. And when you do that, uh, the ADB velocity is actually reported with respect to the head itself. A lot of care needs to be taken to orient the head and to, you know, if you need to rotate the velocity vectors. All right, and I wish I had more time to actually show you the data, but I'll just breeze through the results quickly. Um, so the parameters that were used in this study, so from the ADB, again, they got the mean flow speed, also the turbulent kinetic energy, very similar to the previous study. Um, just a point to mention, they did use the 10 hertz sampling frequency, which usually when you're studying TKE, you'd want to go a little bit higher in, in your sampling frequency. But the reason they did this is because around coral reefs, you actually have environments where you have very low SNR, so very, low, uh, very few scatterers in the water. So in general, um, when you take a longer averaging time period, so all of these acoustic instruments, the name of the game is averaging basically. Um, when you take a longer averaging time period, you reduce the noise, which then brings up your SNR. So this is their balance, um, their sweet spot at 10 hertz, where they had high enough SNR, but also had high enough frequency of data to calculate the turbulent kinetic energy. One other variable that they calculated that you can do uh, using these ADVs is the significant wave height. And this is calculated from the pressure sensor data. Um, you can either use the pressure sensor and process the data yourself, or Sontec provides some um, wave packages that you can use. One is called SonWave for non-directional waves, and then we have SonWave Pro for directional waves. And so the results of this study, so again, uh, they, they were looking at two different fish species, one that lives in higher up in the water column and one that lives closer down to the floor of the reef. And they found that with very low significant wave height, they didn't find much of a difference between what the fish up high were experiencing and the fish down low were experiencing. Same goes with very high significant wave height, so very um, choppy large waves fish up high were experiencing very similar conditions to the fish down low. But there was this me middle range where medium-sized um, wave height really affected the fish up high, but not as much down low. And first of all, the food that these fish like to eat are mainly found in the higher flows because the food is brought in by these higher flows. And it turns out that the fish that were living up high were actually stronger swimmers. So in these medium wave height conditions, um, they were actually able to stay calm and swim and be very comfortable uh, where they live and actually eat more food and compete more uh, versus the fish that live down low who are weaker swimmers. I thought that was a, a neat conclusion to this study. And then finally, just very quickly, so same group um, of scientists are also studying these giant sponges and um, so in the bottom photo, you're, I'm, I'm showing the, their setup here. They're, they're placing the 16 megahertz micro ADB head right in the middle of the sponge oscillum, which is a big opening where the water will 
will come out um, and they're measuring the X current seawater velocity. So what they're able to achieve is this high precision um, radial profile of velocities across this opening. And I was, I was pretty surprised when I learned about this study because if you look at the, the photo on the, on the left middle, um, this was a photo with dye injected into the middle of the sponge. And you actually do see this um, velocity that, that's pushing all of this, this water through the sponge. So what they're trying to do is to examine the variations in pumping rates and how they're affecting the morphology, so the shape and the size of the sponge, and also environmental factors. So what's neat about this is, um, is that they found that these sponges in the Florida Keys and the Bahamas are actually processing a volume of water equivalent to a layer that was 1.7 to 12.9 meters thick each day, which is a lot of water. A lot of water. And they were able to actually overturn the water column every 2.3 to 18 days. So that was kind of a neat result of this study. Uh, I just want to point out again that they were using this long flexible cable, which is an option that you have. Um, this was used because they wanted to avoid the flow disturbance from this large ADV body and actually very precisely place this micro ADV head in the middle of the sponge. And you'll see in the bottom photo at the very back, the yellow battery canister, that's what they used for power. And then you'll see a lift bag. Um, this is one strategy that you can use when you deploy in these shallow reef environments where you can use scuba diving. Um, these lift bags will help you to, to carry up the, the equipment once you're done. All right. Um, now we're going to move on to a completely different application, um, which, not surprisingly, uses a completely different kind of ADV um, that is relevant for, for these research purposes. We're going to talk about how the ADV ocean was used um, to monitor sediment dynamics in a real-time estuarine monitoring program. The principal um, investigator and program director is Grace Cartwright Massey at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And there are many facets to her work um, here, but we're going to focus in on one particular aspect, which is um, the erosion and settling of sediment and the seasonal variations at a location in the York Estuary, which is um, in Chesapeake Bay area of Virginia, so highly populated area. And uh, once again, it's really, really um, cool studies and very comprehensive case, um, case study to talk about. So unfortunately, I won't get to go into great detail about all of the results, um, but we do list, um, we do cite references at the end. Uh, one thing I'm going to focus on first, because this group did it so well, is this very um, practical application question of how do you make, meet the needs of a real-time monitoring network with an ADV? And I broke that down into two um, sort of um, key, key problems they overcame. And one of them is the biofouling that you get when you do longer-term deployments in an estuarine, estuarine environment. And then, of course, the real-time network. So how did they overcome the challenges of getting real-time data out? This is showing the biofouling here, which is, this is about, represents about three months of, of biofouling during their deployment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, unlike other optical instruments, for example, um, they did find that the ADV data were pretty robust, even in the midst of this kind of biofouling. And the reason for that is, as long as if, if there's some something covering up, whether the the transducers, whether it be algae or whether it even be paint, um, it might attenuate the signal a little bit. But as long as you're getting signal out and there's signal to measure, we can calculate the Doppler shift and give you a velocity. Um, the thing to watch for would be if, um, if there's uh, algae or weeds actually in the sampling volume, of course, that would disturb the velocity measurement. Um, but just non-moving biofouling is ADV uh, handles pretty well. Having said that, they did do a very good job trying to mitigate the effects of biofouling. So as you can see in the picture on the right-hand side, what they did was take this clear plastic wrap like 
saran wrap is a brand name you can find at the grocery store and wrap the body of the instrument in the plastic and secure that with electrical tape so that even though biofouling would build up on the instrument, all they had to do when it came time to clean was to take a knife and carefully cut that, um, that, that layer off. So very easy biofouling solution. Nice idea. It is. A lot of these ideas are kind of floating around. You sort of hear them. But what was nice is that they, they employed a lot of these in one uh, in their in their work here in one place. And they also use biofouling paint both on the, the tripod and on the instrument. Um, the on the platform they use an Interlux tri Trilux paint. We, we recommend that for our um, instruments also. You can use it there. But they um, prefer this micro CSC paint on the transducers. Um, it didn't need a primer. It was very um, just a light coat that they thinned with acetone, and um, they used that on the on the transducer. It didn't need any primer. And what I liked also was this group's attention to detail in the way not only that they did the biofouling, but that they were also cognizant of um, dissimilar metals or any corrosion potential. So of course they used the electrical tape to 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 wrap the the plastic wrap. But they also wrapped any metal parts, like the band clamps, with the electrical tape. And they also insulated any clamps around the instrument. They insulated the instrument with this plastic shelf liner. It's kind of um, something you could pick up at a hardware store. It's a rubbery material um, that not only um, helps insulate from uh, corrosion, but also cushions. So when you're clamping things hard around the instrument, you don't want to lose them during the deployment, but it prevents any uh, um, any damage or distortion to the housing. So very um, nice examples of just practical um, practical measures. And you'll see, obviously, they, they use a different model, not the 16 megahertz micro ADV. They use the ADV Ocean. Why? Well, several reasons. One, um, this is our most robust design. You can see it has the biggest, thickest arms. There's no stem even. Um, it's attached to the body of, of the housing. Uh, it is our lowest frequency ADV, and uh, especially when you're doing sediment, there are certain things to consider. Of course, if you don't have enough scatterers, that's a problem. If you have too many scatterers, it could severely attenuate the signal. And uh, the 5 megahertz is our lowest, so it does help better with attenuation if that is a concern. And just depending on what kind of sediment you're interested in, just in general, um, different frequencies respond differently to different sediments. So that's also something to keep in mind. It also has our longest range boundary detection, which they did take advantage of when they mounted it down looking on the tripod and monitored bed changes. And it's our largest sampling volume. So as Shua mentioned earlier, the size of the sampling volume and the spatial averaging that you can get um, helps ensure uh, a robust signal return. I guess it's worth pointing out too, Janice, that it's actually physically the largest ADV as well. True. So whereas the micro ADV was, you know, about this big, uh, this version of the ADV is maybe 10 times larger. So the micro ADV is really meant for this high precision, small work, and and this one is meant for more larger scale. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about in a second, although they, they did have real-time data needs, uh, they used the autonomous uh, Hydra version of this instrument because they did want the data recorded as a backup, and uh, they did power the instrument with the underwater batteries. Um, and the fact that the compass is built into that, that white housing itself made it easy to um, retrieve and then remount the instrument the same way every time. Because um, the orientation of the compass with respect to the transducer is, is fixed in the instrument. So um, I, I don't have a great deal of time to go into the details, except to say that they they came up with a fairly simple and elegant solution to get real time data out of this underwater system. Uh, and with a group called Frank Frank Tronics, um, they took an AD, uh, ADV um, battery housing and just put a uh, serial to Ethernet converter. And Ethernet, for, for several reasons, enabled the two-way communications that they needed um, of the instrument. And two-way communications were really uh, important and helpful for several reasons. Um, 
in particular, they were able to shift in and out of what we call like a command mode. In other words, talking to the instrument, even changing the settings. In principle, you could even change the settings based on storm events or things that you expect to impact the data. You could increase the sampling frequency or decrease it if you wanted to. Um, of course, you can recognize problems in the field much more quickly and go out and troubleshoot if you have to, if you, if you see it right away. Um, and so what they did was go between this real-time mode and this deployment mode uh, back and forth where they were able to let the instrument go do its deployment, go do its thing, collect its data, put it on the recorder, then query the instrument, say, download the data, take a look at it, save it as a backup on the instrument or if necessary, format the recorder, and then toggle back and forth between real time, which their, their radios would transmit, and then sending the instrument back to deploy. So the parameters that they obtained, um, and this is a good example, what I, what I really um, admired about this, this study was also the way that they were able to take advantage of so many of the parameters that the ADV offers. So of course, mean current, so the three-dimensional velocity the ADV um, offered, the distance to boundary, or another word for that is acoustic altimetry, the suspended sediment concentration, uh, which was derived from the signal strength so the amount of uh, sediment in the water can be correlated with um, the signal that's coming back. Janice, mm -hmm. is that a technique that's recently used using acoustics for suspended sediment? It is. In this particular case, um, uh, the group used the ADV for this specific estuary work, but another common use for acoustics and, and sediment is in um, the, the USGS's, for example, real-time data network uh, using side-looking instruments. Mm -hmm. So these are profiling instruments that the USGS uses. But same principle, you can measure not only the velocity from the Doppler shift, you can measure the strength of the acoustic signal uh, and infer sediment. And then from in there, infer what's going on with uh, deposition, erosion, uh, sedimentation. And then the last two parameters, getting back to the Virginia study, um, were bottom stress and sediment settling velocity that, again, made a, it's a good example of the, uh, the data, the velocity data, and the concentration data um, to create meaningful parameters and conclusions. So we show here their sampling strategy also. Um, they chose a 10 hertz data frequency. Uh, a burst lasted 120 seconds, and they did that every 15 minutes. And uh, there were several other studies um, ancillary to this work regarding the calibration. Um, this group did a very rigorous job of documenting their calibration methods uh, that we won't get into, but just know that it happened and um, those, those references are available. We show here what their um, profiler looked like. This was not the tripod, this is the profiler that they put into the water periodically to collect um, just real pumps using a pump to collect real uh, grab samples of the water, uh, which they analyzed in the lab for sediments, along with a list, the laser instrument, and an optical backscatter, an OBS sensor. So that work was done on the side. And that is the type of work that's necessary. This calibration is necessary if you're going to use the acoustic signal for sediments. Um, now, I'm not going to give you much time to look at the rest of these slides in the interest of time. Um, but just know that they're, um, they're there and there's just some very cool correlations and, um, and graphs that, that were done with this data. So this is just showing their, their calibration, the calibrations that they were able to obtain. Um, so you can see on the bottom ADV backscatter, so the intensity of the signal correlated with the total suspended solids. And uh, for this particular study, there were two sites in the York Estuary and uh, they, were, they came to be known as the biological site and the physical site um, based on what um, uh, f factors, what forces were dominant at the site. Again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to hone in on the parameters, just of the real-time parameters that you could see at the physical site. On the bottom is the time uh, in days uh, since the start of this deployment. And then three different parameters, the top being current speed, so you can just see the current, you know, oscillating. Uh, 
Um, the second graph on the left is uh, total suspended solids. Uh, you can see the, uh, if you were to compare, you would see that the solids were heavier, the suspended solids were heavier at the physical site. And then the bottom, we have the bed elevation, so that acoustic altimetry. So you can see, um, as time went on, maybe about the 35th day, an event started to happen that created um, some, uh, some sort of a scouring effect and then some deposition. And so what I like about this data set is that it just shows you can almost picture in your head what was going on physically where the AGV was. Um, once again, they were able to calculate settling velocity, and the method for that is shown here. Unfortunately, I, I'm going to skip over this pretty quickly, but they compared what happened at the biological and the physical site. And then also uh, the bed erodibility. And so what what they were able to conclude was that there was a correlation between the sediment settling velocity, which was one of those calculated parameters from the ADV, and the bed erodibility. And I'm just going to show us sort of the, the, the conceptual model here to share what their conclusions were um, from the data to, that, that were eventually supported this model. That the biological site, which was downstream, uh, and you can see that shown on the left-hand side in the, in the little picture, um, where bivalves and worms and things actually in, in the soil, in the bed, um, help anchor uh, the, the soil, and then uh, can, through their biological activities, sort of conglomerate the sediments, uh, which contributes to the higher settling velocity and the lower bed erodibility. In contrast, the physical site was predominated more by, as suggested, the physical factors um, that would suspend and uh, deposit and resuspend um, the sediments. And so there was this more layering, this more laminar uh, quality to the bed. And there were also seasonal changes associated with, with, each, with each of these sites. Uh, as suggested in the graph, the, the influence of the biology at certain times um, would creep up closer to the physical side, and then they would see um, a decrease in the bed erodibility. Just some, some really neat conclusions. And just lastly, uh, kind of bringing it all together, these, this is where the biological site was downstream near Chesapeake Bay, and uh, the, the physical site is sort of the red circle um, farther upstream. And there's some really cool um, radiograph images shown in the upper right-hand corner where this sort of modeled effect um, of the bed is created by the biology, whereas in the x-ray on the left, this more layering effect of just the sediments layering and, and um, being deposited. So it's very cool conclusion. So um, lastly, this is going to be our, our last case study. Um, the principal investigator here is um, uh, Dr. Gregor Reed, who we, we show, and I think he's going to be a good sport about this, <laughs> showing how we uh, do the compass calibration or is how it's uh, effectively known as the compass dance. And it looks like he's having more fun with it than our average user, so I wanted to share that. <clears throat> so what um, Dr. Reed is doing in Canada is looking at how we can um, take the nutrients when you're, when you're farming fish, take the nutrients from one species and use those to feed other species. And in this case, um, three different species were involved at this aquaculture farm, Atlantic salmon, blue mussels, and kelp. And this type of um, farming is called integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. And uh, I'm going to be sort of summarizing the work from two different studies that he was involved in um, that are cited there. So, so why, why were the ADVs of interest here? Um, well, as we can see, uh, they have pictures here on the left of the salmon cages and then in the middle of the mussel socks that hang down from the floating platforms at this farm. Um, so the salmon, of course, as they're being um, grown and, and fed, they emit waste. Those are nutrients that could be considered waste, or they could can be considered food for filter feeders like mussels. And then what's left over from the mussels can be used by kelp. The inorganics that are coming through can uh, grow kelp. So, of course, this has implications for 
just the efficiency of, of your farm and where you would place these structures in relation to each other, um, but also can, can have uh, uses when you're, when you're uh, reporting on the environmental impact of aquaculture, um, as well as working on models. And there's just, as discovered in these uh, studies, there are just so many variables, especially when you're getting out into open water, that affect um, the water properties. And just having that extra ADV data uh, were really useful. Just an overview to give you here uh, uh, an idea of where these structures were in relation to each other. Uh, the salmon cages were, um, are shown on the right. And uh, or actually, the salmon cages are closest to us. The muscle circles are in the middle, and um, the yellow circle where that uh, muscle circle is located is, is where the ADVs were deployed for the study. And then farthest away from us um, are the kelp rafts. So just zoning in on that yellow circle where the ADVs were deployed, um, in the muscle circle, you can, you can see on the right, we show the, the lines of muscles, um, the lines that were um, marked by buoys, and then the, the muscle socks would hang down. And the ADVs that we chose here were Argonaut ADVs, and we deployed them uh, down looking from these buoys um, using a one hertz average, so um, just the, the standard Argonaut ADV frequency is one hertz, um, 10 second average, and then a 10 minute sample interval. And then just taking that data, um, uh, they further post-process post -process that into hourly means to look at the, the overall current. So Janice, I was actually thinking about this, and even though they use um, mean currents as their parameter, I was wondering, you know, why didn't they use an ADCP, for example? Um, it can cover a wider range. Yeah, as, as you can see in this, this picture, I, I, one thing you might think is, oh, stick an ADP head in there, but you have the, the kelp or the, uh, the muscle swaying around. You have to get a boat in there and, and orient it properly. It's a very finite sampling volume of the ADV allows you just to get in there and position the sensor where you know the measurement's going to be taken. Yeah, yeah, and I can imagine an ADP with its beam spreading would start hitting all different kinds of obstacles. Exactly. Um, really a nice showcase of, of why you would need an ADV. Right. Case. Yeah, even though it is open, kind of, you can think of this as an open water application. Yeah. Um, definitely ADV. So why the Argonaut ADV? Uh, as the picture shows here and as the photograph showed, it just, everything is self-contained in, in this one lightweight container. It's very portable. Um, as a matter of fact, you can program it and remove the cable. So you'll notice uh, when they did the deployments here in the muscle circle, there, there are no cables hanging down. They could just um, put it on their, their bracket and, and put it in the water at the buoy. So it makes it very easy to deploy and retrieve. Um, the compass and the tilt sensor are standard. So you know, once again, no fuss. Just uh, put the ADV probe in the water and you know that even though it's hanging down, um, the orientation of the ADV stays the same um, relative to its compass. So those data, those velocity data, those current data, um, no matter how you deploy it, um, are going to be translated back properly. Although you still, of course, want to deploy the instrument the same way every time um, to, to, as far as practical. One of the tips, actually, that, that Dr. Reed suggested was he had multiple instruments. And in order to ensure that you are putting the same ADV back in the same location, even, it helps to think ahead and flag those with some kind of colored tape. Uh, uh, so this vector averaging function um, correlates the ADV data with the compass um, during data collection. And then, again, just meant to be simple and easy to use, the, the Argonaut has this auto velocity ranging feature. So unlike the other ADVs, which allow you to, to specify exactly which, auto, which velocity range, the Argonaut um, does sampling just prior to uh, data collection and will select the best auto velocity range for you. Just some photographs um, real quick to, to show kind of the mounting options that they experimented with. They, they had this uh, bracket in 
sort of uh, streamline the calibrating of all the ADV compasses at once. And then different deployment options. You, you could, you know, this isn't rocket science. It's, it's you know, it's tailoring the, the deployment to your, to your needs. But uh, one thing they tried was hanging the ADVs down looking from this, this bar and then having a diver position that. That's the picture on the left or going to the edge of the muscle circle and then um, it was hanging the ADB down looking off of a, a rod. Uh, and the results, uh, just real briefly here, just showing the, the current plots that they were able to, to derive um, at the different places in the muscle circle. On the right-hand side graph, um, the blue line is just showing the, the trend of the currents at the open water side, uh, whereas the yellow, um, the line indicates the current trends at this closer to the salmon cages. And what they were, what they discovered is that sort of the, um, you know, the salmon cages, there was a more, much more northerly current than the, the, the theoretical model would, would have predicted, and that the currents were different depending on where you were in the muscle circle. So they were able to draw some conclusions about the impact of uh, the muscles, uh, the muscles in the in the raft on the current, and um, able to make some inferences, such as the particles coming from the salmon cages are likely to arrive at at a slower, less variable rate than when the water is coming in from the ocean with the ebb and the flow. So there's going to be a different behavior of particles depending on whether it's an ebb or a flow. So that's important too. And, and all of this has implications for um, the modeling and then how to um, feed the different species involved because the concentrations at the rate at which the water is delivering the, these concentrations of nutrients um, will, will um, will matter as the animals themselves need, need food and nutrients at certain rates. Uh, so then in a, in a sort of a different study that, um, uh, that goes, kind of does take it to the le next step, um, those same Argonaut ADVs were used at a different uh, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture site um, along with some ammonium measurements. And just once again, unfortunately I can't go into super great detail, but there, were, there was a demonstrated correlation between uh, ammonium concentrations and the currents. Uh, for example, the lowest current, so the slowest water, did correlate with the highest levels of ammonium, ammonium being the more limiting nutrient in ocean ecosystems. But that wasn't always the case. So to the degree we need to explain what's going on, um, these current data were useful. Okay, that was our, our last um, case study. And before we conclude, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the Flow Tracker 2, the handheld version of the ADV, uh, does have some new features that make it what I think is more capable than ever in research environments. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of those real quick. Um, there's a whole webinar on the Flow Tracker, so if you want to go over some of the neat features, uh, that's available. Um, one of them, uh, of course, being that it has a screen where you can see data plots, multiple data plots. You can scroll down and see velocities and signal strength and temperatures and, and so on, um, as well as a GPS and a faster sampling, <clears throat> faster sampling than its predecessor. So although it samples at two hertz, there, there's actually some faster sampling options, options possibly. So just give us a call if you're interested in that. One thing that we were able to do with the, with the new flow tra tracker um, is do faster pinging and uh, concentrate the electronics down at the head of the instrument. So we do see um, better SNR performance in lower scattering environments. Um, so as she mentioned, the, the lower noise and the better quality data you can get um, in low scattering or high scattering is, is now possible with the handheld ADV. And lastly, just this year, we, were, um, we came out with the model that incorporates a pressure sensor into the instrument. So instead of having to key in the depth and measure it some other way, now really you can put the probe anywhere in the water and have a depth measurement recorded 
And what Sonic has also innovated is a very rigorous way to use the pressure sensor by compensating for the Bernoulli, Bernoulli principle. Of course, we have acoustics. We know the speed of the current. We can, we can compensate for the very effect of that, uh, that current on the pressure, pressure data. And, and because we have the pressure sensor, you know, I, I can imagine many options, and we've already, we already know of uh, customers who are um, using the, the instrument in shallow open water um, in coral situations, uh, or just in, in marshland where you know, you're not, uh, you really have to move around and, and gather a data set. You have the GPS to mark your location. So just a lot more capabilities to keep in mind. And with that, um, we're going to bring it home and, and summarize that we presented uh, several different case studies and, and talked about the different um, mixing and matching of configurations that can be done with the ADVs, uh, just depending on your data needs. It's not your job to know all of the ins and outs of that. It's our job. So um, uh, just give us a call if you have any questions. And before we, we open it up to questions and answers, just special thanks to all of our um, application um, case study contributors, um, Desiree Tillos, Chris Finelli, um, Grace Massey, and Gregory. Their work is here in, these, in this references page uh, for your reference. And now um, we, we packed a lot of information in, so we're just going to take a few questions and then uh, send out the follow-up afterwards. Okay, great. Uh, Let me see what questions we have. Maybe I can give Janice a little break and, and cover the first question Thank you. Um, briefly. So a question about the burst sampling options that you have. Can you explain, again, how burst sampling might give advantages? Um, so if you can imagine setting up your system so that you want a sampling interval of, say, 15 minutes. Um, you're interested in parameters like turbulent kinetic energy, which requires a very high sampling rate. But you might also be interested in mean currents. Um, say mean currents, you know, that's easy. You just take a time average of your measurements. Turbulent kinetic energy requires a lot more measurements in a given time frame. You're not required to actually measure for the entire 15 minutes of your sampling interval. Say you want to only measure for one minute and get the turbulent kinetic energy. Um, this is the burst sampling is a way to do that. So you can actually shorten up um, your sampling within your larger sampling interval, so that when you don't want to sample, you are actually conserving your your power that way. Um, this is particularly useful when you want to do um, directional wave analyses. So you want to do Fourier analyses, frequency analyses on the, the, the actual velocity vectors. This requires a lot of velocity data to come in, but you're not required to actually measure this whole time. Say you're taking a, a 30 minute sampling average. Um, you can just measure for the sufficient amount of time just to get that one part of your directional wave data and then have the instrument be quiet the rest of the time just to really conserve energy. And we've, we've found that it, it really boosts um, how long you can deploy these instruments um, in practice. And there's a nice schematic from our manuals that uh, shows burst sampling. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can put that in the, in the FAQ document afterwards. Um, so I have a question here that is, um, is there a paint that can be used to lower what I think is corrosion um, due to deployments in warm, salty waters? Um, and that's a good question. I, um, we're, we recommend a different anti-fouling paint, uh, but one specifically for corrosion, uh, I don't know of. So if there's any, any, any viewers who um, have specific recommendations in that regard, um, please let us know and we'll share that with the group. But what I will say, what I have seen done to, to, to essentially do the same thing is um, this good old electrical tape, um, wrapping your housing in, in that has um, an insulating effect. Um, uh, somewhat like paint, but uh, anything that would insulate in that way, um, I've seen that done. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but I, I guess again, just to point out the actual corrosion of the battle um, is really mitigated by those zinc anodes, which kind of typically found on most most instruments that you put in the ocean. Um, so just monitor those and make sure that they they're still there. Right. Uh, the, um, the York River tripods, they, they zinc everything. They're tripoding this, this insulating that I spoke of. Uh, so it's definitely something to be aware of. I would say there's no overdoing it. <laughs> um, let's see. How long do the battery packs last for deployment of the ADV Hydra? Uh, so we can give you some nominal values based on just continuous sampling. If you were to, to sample the instrument continuously, um, we're looking at maybe a 10 to 14 uh, day deployment if you're sampling constantly nonstop and that's conservative with a buffer. But of course, as Shua mentioned, with burst, um, using burst sampling, you can make the ADB essentially wake up and then go back to sleep and wake up and go back to sleep and uh, in different configurations. So any, just starting from there, starting with about a two-week deployment and then depending on how you um, structure your duty cycle, as we call it, you can extend it as necessary. The Argonaut ADV, I would say, um, because of its low power requirements, with that integrated battery um, can be on the order of, say, 16 days. Or if you have this sort of, it's still smaller external battery pack, it's on the order of a month and a half continuous. Okay, um, sorry we went over a little bit, but thanks for sticking with us and thanks for submitting your questions. We will put those in a document and we will send you this presentation in our follow up email. Thanks, everybody. All right, thanks, everyone.